Good morning. I'm Greg Mellick. I cover the retail broadlines and hardlines uh, here at Evercore ISI. Uh, and uh, one of the joys of covering retail uh, and also a lot of the home furnishing uh, space over the years is getting to know Clarence Smith, who's the uh, CEO of Haverty, uh, a pretty interesting business with a long uh, history and track record of success and cash flow. Uh, certainly a tumultuous last few years. So with no further ado, I want to hand it over to Clarence. Um, Thanks for joining us this morning and maybe give us an update on where the business is and, and how you see it to continue to succeed in the future. Well, thank you, Greg. I, uh, I've been very happy to be in this business over the last year or so. We, we uh, had a record year last year. Uh, we we uh, were up 35%. We reached uh, over a billion dollars. We earned uh, $4.90 last year, which was an all-time record. Uh, and yes, it was a comeback from uh, being down in COVID, uh, but we, I think that we've changed our business uh, significantly. Uh, we are targeting a better customer. Uh, we're located in uh, 120 stores in 16 states, mostly in the South, from Virginia to Texas. So we're located in the right parts of the world where people are moving. Our biggest states are Florida, Texas, Georgia, Virginia, and the Carolinas. So we think we're located in the right parts of the world where people are coming. And I think that the value of the home has changed. So uh, we feel like we're in a very good position. As Greg talked about it, we, we've been in this business for a long time. We, we're the, we think we're the oldest company in Atlanta. We're older than Coke. Started in 1885 doing the same thing, serving home furnishers mainly in the South. So we like our position and uh, like where we are right now. Maybe to follow up right on that first point, um, sales up a lot last year, um, 35%, as you mentioned. Uh, if you look before COVID, though, we, we sales were sort of flattish or sort of slightly down. Could you, you know, help us describe what what was going on then uh, that had them in that sort of environment? And now, you know, what's changed and frankly, how you keep growing sales from this level? You know, maybe not this year, but at least longer term, how you continue to build the business. We were flat for several years, um, as you pointed out, Greg. One of the things that we chose purposefully to do is to upgrade our product mix, uh, target a customer who's not in the promotional space. We had a specific role and goal of separating ourselves from Ashley and Rooms to Go, who are the main players who sell the most furniture in these markets. And, and we added designers. We added, we call them H designers to our team. We're doing about 25, almost 30% in special order and custom. It's a new category for us, but we've developed it um, over the last five or six years. And I think we're, we're now experts at it. So we, we moved into a different uh, strata of, of competitors. We moved into the Ethan Allen, um, even restoration, our house level a little bit. We're underneath them. But uh, I think we offer a better service and a better value. And that customization has helped separate us. It's at, driven our average ticket up. Our average ticket is over $3,000 now. And when we get into people's homes, it's uh, double that. So that's helped separate and I think drive our business and continues to drive our business. When you say get into people's homes, is that where one of the designers can be there and actually help outfit the whole room or? Absolutely. Uh, whole concept. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and now that COVID is behind us or mostly behind us, we're able to get into people's homes. And before it was an issue. They, they didn't really want people to come in their homes, understandably. But that's now uh, coming back. We're doing more in custom, more in special order. And I think that'll continue to be a driver for us. It, it, is, it is important and it's a no charge service. We, we don't mm -hmm. charge anything for that. No, that's unusual, right? How many uh, customers now take advantage of that offering? It's about 25% of mm -hmm. our customers. And, and we don't want to get it to be, we don't, we're not a design house like Ethan Allen. Right. We're not <laughs> a design house. So um, we're comfortable with the 30% range of, mm -hmm. of um, special order and, and design uh, because we're still appealing to the rest of the market um, and that's that's actually the bigger part of our business. Got it. You don't want to compete with the designers, right? You still want them to use you and your product. 
That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe to transition a little bit more in terms of uh, this, this period has been hard to get supply. Uh, true in a lot of retail categories and furniture, probably no, uh, no, no uh, different from any other in that regard, maybe a little worse. Could you help us understand a little bit more about where you source your product from, uh, the challenges of being in stock, uh, how, how long it can take now to get a custom order uh, piece of furniture? Well, it is a challenge and it, it's improving, but it was a significant problem last year and it continues to be. We moved almost all of our wood furniture. At one time it was in China and when the tariffs were put on several years ago under the Trump administration, we moved pretty aggressively to move our wood furniture production to Vietnam. And almost mm -hmm. all of our wood now comes from Vietnam. We're still importing from China. Uh, the container prices went up, getting the containers was an issue. You, you know that story. Um, mm -hmm. We were at $3,500 mm -hmm. a container and then it got up into the high 20s. It is gonna be higher. It is more expensive to bring the product there. Um, and what also happened was because of COVID, uh, the, the factories was shut down in Vietnam, starting them back up with Chinese New Year was also an issue getting their workers back. They have an issue with workers like we do. And that production caused a big backlog. Our backlog is, is mm -hmm. significant. It's as big as it's ever been. And uh, we think it's actually going to help us for the rest of this year. But that production's coming back. The, the factories are back up about 70 to 90 percent in Vietnam, and we are getting the case goods now. But it has been a it has been a, a downward pull on our business because we were out of business in, a, in several important categories, all related to wood. Upholstery is better. We're getting better production from upholstery. Mm -hmm. We're doing more custom from uh, domestic factories, which are in North Carolina and in uh, Mississippi. And that's improving. So we see this improving in the second and third quarter this year. And uh, however, I think last year we we had a good relationship with our suppliers. We paid to get the product, and I think we might have outproduced uh, and outdelivered some of our competition because of that. You know, that's a um, I mean, thirty five percent sales growth, the big number, <laughs> maybe. Help us understand that a little bit more. You had these supply chain challenges. It was most of it average ticket. Um, you know, how much inflation do you think there would be in that kind of number? Well, there's definitely some inf inflation in there, um, and mm -hmm. it might be up to it might be double digit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, somewhere in the low double digit inflation is part of it. Um, average ticket, yes, it is up, uh, but I do think that we're providing a, a broader service. We're, we're we're doing more for the home than we did before. We're doing more in accessories, uh, which is part of getting in the, the customer's home and the customization. Um, so yes, is some inflation, but one of the things we've been able to do is to increase our margins and that we see that continuing. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason we're able to do it is we're getting credit for these services that we're doing. I, I, I think we were chasing a lower price point before now we're providing a better quality. It is more custom. And I think our customer recognizes the value there and we're providing a better service, which allows us to justify that higher margin. I do want to get into the margins in a little more detail, but while we're still talking about sales, uh, I'd love to ask you a question that we get literally every day from investors, which is with rising gas prices and inflation, not just in furniture, but across the economy. Uh, are you seeing any shifts in demand uh, preference, just overall demand or people trading down to lower price point items at all um, in the last month or two? We or haven't seen trading down in prices. We, we have not seen that. Uh, we did say in the fourth quarter when we released that um, we saw some softening in of incoming orders. Um, mm -hmm. And we haven't released about that. But the okay. everything... Everything about our business is related to the home. So if, if home price, if, if home sales are down and consumer mm -hmm. confidence is, not, is down, that's not great for our business. But we feel like we're in a great position right now. And it has helped uh, us reach a, a higher ticket and, and I think a better customer. We're not trying to drive prices mm -hmm. down. I do think that this quarter and next quarter will be a little more aggressive in credit. 
we we had backed off of that significantly last year because it wasn't important. I think it's mm -hmm. more important to the customer today than it was in the past. And you'll see us be a little more aggressive in credit, but not in discounting. That's not part of our strategy. And, and remind me, what percentage of your sales are sold with some form of credit? Um, in, in the low 30%. Low in the low thirty, yes. All right. So when you say get back to that, that's sort of getting back to the low thirties. It may have been a little lower the last last year. Right, and I think it's a, a, it's more important this year than it was last year. And and I that, that that we've got that strategy, we've got the ability to do it, and I think that will be more important. So, so maybe the, the the natural transition to to profitability and margins. You mentioned you know getting getting paid for the services you're providing. Uh, I think if you know margins used to be around five percent pre COVID, and now they're up to almost twelve EBIT margins. Could you walk us through you know how much of that expansion you think is sustainable, or is all of it sustainable uh, as the demand and cost environment normalize? I think we have articulated that we we believe we can maintain double digit operating profits, mm -hmm. and I think we can, and that's our strategy. Will it be at twelve percent steady? No, I don't think that. But I do believe that we've got the capabilities to maintain the price points. Uh, yes, expenses are up. We've got labor pressures. We've got freight pressures, but we're able to increase the product pricing to be able to maintain that. And that is our strategy. And I believe we can maintain that. Got it. If we were to break down that expansion, how much of it is, is from product margin and how much of it is from you know, increased sales productivity, just having more sales going through your system? Would you? Well, if you, inflation alone is probably 10%. Um, mm -hmm. You're talking about operating profit. Okay. Yep. So, uh, it, before pro COVID, we, ha we had like um, almost 4,000 employees. We're down to uh, less than 3,000 employees okay. doing the same thing. So we are definitely more productive wow. with our people. And um, yes, we're paying them more. But I think mm -hmm. that uh, we've got our salespeople producing more. We're getting more out of our warehouse and delivery. And and. Um, that efficiency has been the main driver, frankly, combined mm -hmm. with being able to have some pricing power in the product. Uh, I think you you started when you outlined um, the company uh, you know, going through the number of stores and the potential. Could you talk us through, maybe not just about this year, but thinking out three to five years, you know, how many stores you could have, would want to have, um, you know, any any new markets you'd want to enter or, or any store openings, more infills. How do you think about that front? It's mostly infill. We, we've got three main distribution centers in, um, here in Brazelton and Florida and in Texas, and then one in Virginia that we're going to be expanding. We see opportunities within that footprint. We don't right now have a strategy to move outside of that. It could allow us to reach a couple more states, but we th mm -hmm. think there's some, op some important opportunities within this footprint expanding uh, in the better markets. We are looking at a smaller store format. Our average store, let's say five, six years ago, was 40, almost 50,000 square feet. It's now about 35,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And at mm -hmm. several stores we've opened recently are in the 20, 20 mid 20,000 square foot and are producing very well. And I think relying on the internet and the ability to expand the product mix without necessarily having the square footage allows for more opportunities in several markets to add important stores and, and be able to reach customers we're not reaching now. Most people want to see the product. At our price point, customers want to see the product. Uh, it, it, in internet sales are mid single digits. They're not a, the big part. We know we can increase that, but when, People see our product online or in our ads. They want to physically see the, the, the merchandise because it's expensive and they can. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to be where they, uh, where they live. You, you mentioned uh, the competitors and that, that whole scope of the market. Um, I guess help us understand a little bit more about how, how Haverty differentiates 
when you open one of these stores or go into a market and expand your presence vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, a traditional furniture store or one of these other, um, whether it's restoration or Ethan Allen or you name it, how, how are you different? Well, first of all, I think that uh, we have the designers, we have the people that uh, interact with the customer. Um, we let our customers know our, our marketing messages, which are um, on digital uh, and, and broadcast and over the top, talk about the design opportunities, talk about the differentiation. We're not pushing discount, we're not pushing price. We talk mm -hmm. about the product and what we can do for the customer. And I think in our markets, people know who we are. It's, it's a little more expensive and difficult when you move into new markets, but I think we've been able to make it clear that we offer better service, a better value. And the other thing that is actually demonstrated in the transaction itself is all of the warehouse people, all of the delivery people are Haverty's team members. You know, when you buy a product, who the, who the delivery driver is, who, what his name is, you've got his picture, what time he's gonna be there. All of those types of things, I think build our reputation that we're going to take care of the customer. We offer a better service. That's great. So the, the 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 over the threshold deliveries. So the ones that you're bringing them, you're bringing them into people's houses. These are all done with your people coming from your distribution centers. Yes, they are. Every mm -hmm. single employee coming into your home, whether it's service delivery, decorator, those are Haverty team members. Those are mm -hmm. our team members on our payroll. We do not do any third party delivery. It, I think, does help separate the service levels. Uh, and and uh, given the tight labor market, how have, how have you been able to keep those people? Um, it's, I, <laughs> it, it's particularly a challenge in the warehouse and delivery. Uh, we mm -hmm. have raised our rates. Um, we are very competitive. It's stabilizing. It was very difficult last year. I'd say it's stabilizing now. We're almost at full staff and um, we're paying more though. We're definitely mm -hmm. paying more, frankly, across the board. Um, and, and that goes back to how can we do that and maintain double digit? Because I think we offer a better product and we're able to justify pricing it that way. What percentage of your sales now are the, the special order, so to speak, where you're, I think, I would imagine that's where you're really leaning into. Uh, it's in, in the mid 20s, uh, and let's say 25 okay. to 30%. Okay, so it and does I, roughly align with the designer aid yes, of sales? It yes, it does, because they're the ones primarily driving it. Even though you can do it online or our regular salespeople can do it, it still aligns with dealing with a uh, designer. Got it with designer aided sales. Um, one of the, the neat things of you know, looking at your company and the financials over time has been that that steady cash flow and dividend. Um, could you describe you know what's happened with with investments and in capital spending, um, and also what your plans are going forward as you do more infills and store openings? We do generate a lot of cash, and we've done that for a number of years, and we've been consistent in paying back to our shareholders. Um, in, in 2020, uh, we returned 70 million of our cash flow. Uh, it was uh, 20 million in share repurchases and 15 million in dividends. And then 21, we returned $94 million in cash to our shareholders and 41 million in shares and 17 million in dividends and 35 million in special dividends. And uh, we did special dividends when we have more than we need and uh, we look at that every year. So our board believes in returning about 50% of our earnings back to the shareholders. We've done more than that because we've generated more cash than we needed. Uh, we had 160 something million at the end of the year. Previous year, we had over 200 million. We've got significant cash flow. We believe in giving it back to shareholders in addition to investing in our business. So this year we've said we're gonna have about 37 million in capital expenditures. A lot of that's IT. Uh, there's some in distribution 
and obviously some in stores. So it's a mix, it's a balance, um, and we are consistent with that. We are um, out of debt. We have no debt. Don't expect to be in debt. We got out before the Great Recession, which is a good thing. And um, I don't believe that this particular industry can handle a lot of leverage. And uh, we, that's one of the reasons we've been around a long time. Um, as an aside, we went public uh, in October of 1929, and we had our cash and the investment house didn't. But that's one of the reasons I'm still talking to you, is we are a conservative <laughs> company. We do invest in our business, and we do give back to the shareholders. Uh, that's a that's a great track record to to, to highlight. I, I guess just to just so I understand a little more the the philosophy. It seems like is more dividend than share of purchase. Well, uh, actually, but, if you look at if you look at it over several years, it's pretty balanced, uh, and okay. it, it's all a matter it's all a matter of how it is at the end of the year. So, um, okay. you know, yes, I mean we we last year we had forty two million in in share repurchases and dividends yeah we had a special dividend of 35 and then the regular of 17 so we will see we've also had a record of increasing our dividend our quarterly dividend every year um i'm not sure how that will go forward but the directors and the board makes that decision okay but it seems like historically you look at the prior year earnings and then you think about how we're going to return that amount uh in the following 12 months to shareholders is that a and we're looking at a at a goal of 50 percent yes 50 is a normalized goal okay great right. um on the competitive uh front I'll, I'll pivot there a little bit more is is how are you seeing the competition we talked a little bit about labor you have to pay more to get people um at least in warehousing how is it in terms of uh any promotions on products? Have we have we seen that yet? Or you know, can you describe the promotional environment today versus a couple of years ago? And how well, you I'd say last shift? year was the least promotional market I've ever seen in my career. Now, mm-hmm. now we're starting to see some concern from players about business, and we may start to see discounting again. We haven't seen that. I mentioned earlier credit. Uh, credit will be more important. So that'll be an, an issue and, and probably see more of that. Um, the independent players are going to have pressure in getting the product and being able to deliver. Uh, we all have mm-hmm. some of that issue, but I think the larger players will have more leverage to get the product to be able to deliver it. And um, if incoming orders slow down, people start getting, you know, pretty jumpy and, and may start trying to discount. That's not going to be our philosophy. We, we don't feel we need to do that. We're not going to do that. We will use credit as our main promotional driver. Got it. And, and how high has credit ever gotten as a percentage of the business, if I were to look back? Oh, well, we used to be a credit house. So... Mm-hmm. <laughs> So over fifty percent in the way. Oh way yeah, back. yeah. I mean, when we had our own credit, which was before the Great Recession, yep. uh, it was probably 80 percent of our business. Wow. But that was before we upgraded. It was before we mm-hmm. had designers. It was before we did customization, and um, we've moved out of that. We do not own any of our credit. Well, it's a very, very small part. Most of it is mm-hmm. outsourced. Uh, I'd say ninety-five percent of it's outsourced. Got it. Well, look, I, I, I think we've got time for one more question before we get everybody uh, uh, to the next session. I, I guess if I was to keep it general, what didn't I ask uh, that you wanted to make sure that everybody understood about Haverty, uh, the business and the prospects? Well, I think one of the things that we didn't get too deep into is the, um, the markets we're in. We feel mm-hmm. like we're in the best markets possibly in the world to be in the furniture business. Our biggest states are in Florida. We're going to be continuing to grow in Florida. And then Texas. We're growing in Texas. I'm going out in in a few weeks, a new store we're opening in Austin. Uh, We want to grow up in the Atlantic region, which is in the Virginia and and all of the coastal region up there. And we're going to be adding to our distribution center to be able to service that customer better there. So 
we're located where our customers and most of the United States wants to be and um, uh, in the home furnishings business. And I think the home and the value of the home has become more important and will be permanently more important. So we're glad of, we're glad to be here and in this position. And, and, and obviously it's always better to be where things are growing and where household formation's growing. Uh, do you have a, a, a TAM estimate for, for the states that you're in that, that you'd like to share with us? Or is there any other way to frame that? Um, How about explaining TAM first? Uh, I'm sorry, yes. Total addressable market. Uh, oh, well, I, I think that uh, we will still stay focused on those areas. Uh, and, and that would okay. be, uh, you know, I, I see the most opportunities still in, in Florida and then, mm -hmm. um, and then Texas and then the Carolinas. So it's those are the opportunities. And it's, it's not going into other areas. It's sticking with the core home furnishings market. Absolutely. Staying mm -hmm. where we are, we will add some categories. We'll add outdoor. We'll add third party mm -hmm. companies and be able to deliver through our own distribution center and through third party that will give us some opportunities. And I think our investments in the internet, we're, we're spending a great deal of money on upgrading our new site. We'll have a new launch in, in several months that will help us reach a customer and for them to be able to interact with us quicker and, and easier. So that'll be an important part of our growth too. Clarence, it's a great, we got through a lot in uh, just under a half hour. So I really appreciate okay. your time. Um, you, excited to, I'll see you later this week. And thanks for taking us through the Haverty story. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it.